I'm here with Senate Minority Leader Joe Benning. Thank you for joining us. Thanks How are you today? Um, let me begin with uh, what was going on in your chamber this week with the McAllister story. I, I was actually quite interested, Joe, that you've been somebody pretty active on this story and pretty outspoken in trying to get the senator to step down, um, yet you didn't say anything during the debate the other day and simply voted in favor of it. Why? Um, I think that my participation in this since May 7th of last year has been pretty wide and outspoken, and everything that I had needed to say had been said throughout those many months. And when we got to the floor and I sat listening to the debate, um, I'll credit Senator Baruth with having laid out perfectly exactly what needed to be said. And I also understood that uh, Senator Flory was laying out from her angle everything that needed to be said. And that probably by the time the two of them were done talking, everybody in the room had made up their minds. There wasn't anything I was going to add to the conversation. And I stood, and I was very tempted to stand. Uh, it was when Senator McCormick kicked in mm. about his observations, and especially his reference to the Vermont Constitution. Uh, I like to think of myself as a Vermont constitutional scholar. I would have made some remarks they would have been centering on the, the argument having been made that the citizens of Franklin County were being denied their rights, therefore we were technically in violation of our own oath. To me, that was not correct. Our oath is to the people of the state of Vermont, not to any one specific group of the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. And the people of the state of Vermont have a right to have the Senate operating without dysfunction. If we granted the ability of the citizens of Franklin County to continue with their senator, given what was facing him and what we were dealing with as a body, the body would have been in dysfunction. So I think that overall, the citizens of the state of Vermont had a right to have us take the action we did, and we were in fact living up to our oaths of office. Mm -hmm. You're an attorney. You actually um, briefly here uh, gave some advice to Senator McAllister that first day. And the big argument, one of the two arguments that opponents of suspension raised were, was the presumption of innocence. So I'm interested that you, particularly as an attorney, how you got over that hurdle. There are two courts in operation in this case. One is a court of law, and that court of law is subject to the rules of criminal procedure. It's also subject to the responsibility of upholding that ancient American thread of jurisprudence called the presumption of innocence. I respect that. I've argued it for 32 years in front of juries. I've been involved in several trials of sexual assault, and I have spent a lot of hours arguing that in a court of law. But there's a second court here that we're dealing with, and that's the court of public opinion. That court created this creature we know as the Vermont Senate. The Vermont Senate has its own rules and regulations. We operate by Mason's rules and the Constitution. We are not subject to the rules of criminal procedure. We are not subject to the presumption of innocence. We are not subject to any kind of potential judge sitting there and saying, I'm going to suppress X, Y, and Z, so jury, you can't hear that. Mm -hmm. We are subject only to the court of public opinion and the rule of common sense. So in my eyes, uh, we have the responsibility to look at the facts on the ground as they are in, in existence. Uh, we don't have to turn our ears off to any specific thing. And when I reviewed the police officer's affidavit mm -hmm. and I saw what was in seven days, what, what he allegedly told the reporter in seven days, there wasn't any question in my mind that common sense said we have had the integrity of the institution breached by an individual who has not upheld the standards that we, we are expected to uphold by the people. So at that point, I clearly made up my mind he had to go. My preference would have been that he, in fact, was expelled because that would have given the citizens of Franklin County a fair shot. And you may have heard that there was a complicated process that was in front of us if we went that way because it would require the production of witnesses, etc. I don't believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. I believe I could have walked into that room with a tape recorder and the transcript between 
Mr. McAllister and the woman that was monitored by the police and has now become embedded in the affidavit, which is a public document, mm -hmm. and hit the play button on that tape machine. And mm -hmm. that would have ended the case right there. Mm -hmm. I would not have needed to bring in any of the alleged victims in the criminal case, um, not have to mess with any of the possible uh, people who are involved in the criminal case in such a way to jeopardize either the prosecution or the defense. What about the argument that if he had appealed that those witnesses would have been brought in and subjected to questioning and then the, the concern really was that they might not want to testify in a later trial saying, done it already. I come up with the same argument, Mark. I would have hit the play button, let his words do the speaking. And at that point, if he was to subpoena witnesses into the chamber, mm -hmm. it would have been to counter what he himself had said. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would have done that. Mm -hmm. I think he would have tried to say, well, they took this and that out of context. This is the way it really went. And then the actual balancing argument would be, do we believe what he said then, or do we believe what he said now? Right. And frankly, I'm concerned. Um, I think right now his credibility is out the window with me uh, for a couple of different reasons. One is that he told me in May that he intended to resign in November in order to give the Franklin County delegation time to get new names and have them submitted to the governor and a person be appointed to fill his seat who would then be able to learn the rules and regulations before we assembled here in January. Mm -hmm. When I learned in October that he had reneged on that, that really left me shaken. Mm. Uh, now I'm hearing that he's also reneging on the article that appeared in seven days where he gave an interview and freely admitted that he was having sexual relations with these women. Um, his only beef at that point was that the younger one was not 15, she was 16. And now I understand he is backtracking on that as well. To me, that, that is credibility, and that's a very difficult thing to swallow. Mm -hmm. Do you see any reason why, um, I mean, I'm hearing he may resign next week, sometime soon, you know, doesn't sound like he probably would buy that. I, you know, I, I hope that he does. I was hoping right up until the day before yesterday that he was going to do that. In fact, I had a brief moment on the floor where he asked for a, a Right before break. the vote, right? And Didn't you think that? I thought that was the time. Uh, but unfortunately, he has made a decision thus far that has locked him into pride. And I don't believe he's got the ability to overcome that pride right now unless his own family and his friends who have supported him thus far say, Norm, you can't win this argument. We need to have somebody that's representing us in the chamber. And at this point, if you're acquitted and exonerated, you can run for re-election. Mm -hmm. But right now, we need to have somebody sitting in that seat. Last question on this. Did, did uh, Alice Nick, a uh, uh, senator from Windsor County, said to me that this was the politically savvy, suggested it was kind of the easy way out, doing suspension and not expulsion. Is that a fair critique? Well, you know, I, I was not present at the Democratic caucus that was held at Senator Campbell's house. Uh, there's a lot that goes on in that kind of a discussion. And I think one of the things that went on there was that people were uncomfortable cutting the man off from his legislative salary without having a ruling on guilt or innocence. And they were conflating the criminal court with this body politic that we all operate in. And that was probably generating some hesitation on some people's part. Uh, I, I haven't talked to Alice directly, mm -hmm. but I suspect she sees this as a, a compromise position where everybody could sort of feel good about making sure we did the right thing. And that's why I actually voted for that, because I myself felt that all right, I don't have the votes for the expulsion, although I know the citizens of Franklin County are being shortchanged. Mm -hmm. They were shortchanged since May 2nd. Right. And in fact, um, once he was removed from his committee assignments, they haven't had a full vote in the Senate. So for historical purposes, it's been a long haul where they've already been deprived of their full representation. And I think this step by us was designed specifically to protect the integrity of the institution while we're all here. Senator Nick had told me she has not yet read the affidavit and really depended only on what the charges were. 
What do you think of that? Um, I, I feel that's a terrible disservice to being able to make a vote like that. Um, that affidavit is very explicit. It is somewhat horrific. But I'll tell you, um, Bill Doyle teaches a class at Johnson State College. And I'm about to have a conversation with him about this case. Hmm. And I distributed the affidavit to those kids. And I've asked them to read that before we have our conversation in class. Wow. With the goal being what? With the goal that they understand that real people get involved in these kinds of situations. And we need to learn why certain behavior is not acceptable. And that affidavit clearly establishes behavior that was not acceptable. So if the senators who were voting did not take the time to read that document, and I suspect many more than just Alice Nitka were sure. in that category, um, then they were handicapped walking into that conversation. Um, and again, I have, I don't want to backtrack and say they're at fault for something. I mean, everybody reacted to this the best they could. Mm -hmm. None of us have been faced with this before, and I think everybody was trying to do the best under the circumstances. But if we were going to get into a full conversation of expulsion, I would have insisted. And I, in fact, if they hadn't, I would have stood on the floor and read the whole affidavit. You would have read that affidavit, I would have read on, that the affidavit floor, on, on the floor, floor of the Vermont Senate? I, as horrific as it is, I honestly believe it is the only thing that you can do when considering something as outrageous as an expulsion. You have to have a true understanding. And if the courts were ever to become involved, they would have to know exactly what we were looking at when they decide whether or not they want to interfere in this branch of government. You know, I don't think right now I would use a couple of the terms that were in that affidavit in our discussion right now. I wouldn't want to. I would not want to be in that position, but if it became clear to me going around the room that nobody had actually listened to it or read it, mm -hmm. that's troubling. And in order to lay the groundwork for whatever a reviewing court would be looking at, this is the same for everything like GMO labeling and you go down the line of every controversial thing we have done. The courts in reviewing what we do here have to have an adequate understanding of how we came to the decision we did. Right. If they don't, that is a triggering device for the courts to actually inject themselves into our process. And I did not want to leave us hanging in that situation. It would have been a legal nightmare for years. I thought Senator Baruth spoke um, quite uh, eloquently about the issue of power. Yes. Did you? And the power that senators have and, and that power differential. Yes, I absolutely, um, and I should back up and say that he and I have had many hours of conversation over this subject. Um, we had a game plan initially that we were talking about expulsion and I learned that his caucus was not going to enable us to obtain the votes to get the expulsion. We shifted gears and started talking about a compromise. So he and I have had uh, many hours to think about all this and the power differential between a 60 some odd year old man and a person in their late teens is incredible all by itself. But when you add in the factors that she was relying on him for money and for shelter and for food, um, that power differential is absolutely horrible. As a former chair of the Moss Human Rights Commission, I would argue that a hostile work environment was created. Mm -hmm. And this brings me to a different subject. The terms rape and assault connote a violent overtaking. Right. Unfortunately, the English language doesn't quite have adequate words for what went on in this power differential. Hmm. What would you the mean? idea of, of being able to use your skills or your power to manipulate somebody into thinking they had to do something, mm -hmm. that's what he's been charged with. But mm -hmm. the words rape and assault are applied by that, um, the prosecutor, by mm -hmm. the press, etc. And if he in his mind has looked at this and said, well, I didn't forcibly get somebody into this. It was consensual. Maybe that's what he meant the other day. I think that's exactly what he meant. And that's the position that he's had all along. And I suspect that many of his uh, supporters are taking the same position. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that you can actually put somebody in a position where they become vulnerable 
mm-hmm. to an activity like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of the problem, I think, of the English language, that we just don't have a word that adequately describes a situation where on one side you have somebody thinking it's consensual, and on the other side, somebody who feels as if they have to do it, if they don't, they're in trouble. What about the word coerced? I think the word coerced, uh, there's nothing in our statutes that say um, you're going to get a potential life sentence for coercing somebody into sex. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't made that connection yet. All right, I, that was my best shot in well, the English language. The, the, first the one words, I of. the words might be out there, yeah, but we don't have them in statute. Yeah, my, I mean, when I read that affidavit, one of the words that came to my mind was um, the feeling somebody might be being exploited. Did that word come to your that, mind? That too? word is one of the many words that came to my mind. What words came to your mind? Um, uncomfortable, um, feeling twisted into. Um, I could go on with some descriptive adjectives, but the nutshell is you're looking about exploiting or coercing or placing a vulnerable person in a position where they feel they have to perform something. Mm -hmm. You're um, one of nine Republicans uh, in that enviable position of uh, um, having a lot fewer members than the other team. So what's what's the the game plan for the next four months? Are you just going to play defense and... Try to stop um, the worst from the other side? No, I always uh, use the term that I like to drop verbal hand grenades from time to time and see what happens. The role of the minority party, <laughs> especially a group that's uh, now down to eight, as opposed to the other 20. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah, well, the, the nutshell is we don't have a lot of power to drive the conversation, but we certainly have a lot of power to stand up and drive um, consideration of other ideas. If it comes to it, I think a lot of us have the ability to work with the other side on various issues. Our biggest concern since I've been here has always been the ability to not only pass a budget, but to sustain a budget. And we've just never been able to do that, which is why I personally have voted against every budget since I've arrived in this building in 2011. Um, I suspect I'm going to be voting against the next one as well, because I'm listening yesterday, for instance, to a a speech by the governor, which all kinds of new positions are going to be created. We haven't heard yet where they are going to be cutting or raising taxes to afford those positions. And I walked out of that speech down into Senate Government Operations Committee and I listened to a bunch of um, folks who are now state employees who are worried that their jobs are going to be cut because they are extending well, they are asking for people to be um, on a contract. I'm missing the words in the terminology right now. But, uh, they want to put those positions out to bid for people and mm-hmm. uh, have somebody come in that's not a state employee to save money. Right. So, you know, if you're going to do that on the floor of the House in your speech to say we're going to add all these positions, well, at the back door, you're actually cutting positions. We've got to be honest about that and let people know what services are going to be changed. And right now, I don't, uh, I don't see that conversation happening. And I think that's the job of us in the minority to start raising a little noise about it. Well, Senator Berth raised a, a similar issue, talking about a program that he said sounded very appealing. It was a two million dollar program, yeah. the, the Man Up program that they want to extend. And he said the same thing, which is that. You know, as appealing as it sounds, that money's going to come from somewhere else. I did mention that he and I go out to lunch a lot together. We've spent many hours together, so hopefully some of me is rubbing off on him. Mm -hmm. How about is any of him rubbing off on you? I think uh, he always presents the issues in a way that I have to step back and take a second look at the position that I'm taking. Um, There isn't anything that has been so dramatic that I would change my normal stance on things. But it has stopped me and forced me to sit back and think about what it is I'm looking at, how I've approached it, and to make sure that if he's got a point about something, then I may want to move in that direction if it's in the best interest of the state of Vermont. Mm-hmm. When you listened to the governor's speech yesterday, what, what, did, what was your looking at him knowing he's leaving, hearing him talking about these ideas? What, what, did you, what, what were you thinking? Um, my thoughts were changing constantly. One of the more interesting pieces of that conversation was when he started talking about divestiture. 
and people around the room were clapping. Uh, one of the people who was not clapping was Treasurer Beth Pierce. That was You a, looked. I looked, mm -hmm. and I, it was a tremendous <laughs> signal to me. Now, I <laughs> knew from prior committee testimony of hers when we talked about this subject that she was not in favor. She right. preferred to stay in the, the loop, if you will, to be able to try to do things from the inside, but that those um, investments are supporting a lot of our pension systems. And if you start to divest them on the policy argument, while not recognizing how that impacts the financial situation, that's problematic. It's one thing for a governor who's pushing policy to say that and try to mass the forces and get everybody whipped up in a frenzy about it. But when you're having an actual impact on the people's lives who are depending upon those funds, mm -hmm. it's another story altogether. So when I saw her not clapping, that's a big signal to me. Things like that were happening all day during his speech. I really appreciated the fact that he brought in some people who are demonstrating success. Mm -hmm. Um, I appreciated the fact that he brought in Laura Sobel's children. Mm -hmm. I think it was very important for all of us to unite in demonstrating our support for people like that. Yeah. Um, so there were things going on, but it was like a roller coaster in my head. I would hear one thing that was great and another thing that was really down, and back and forth we went. If you could have one thing happen by the end of May or whenever you get out of here, what would it be? A sustainable budget. That the people can not only support, but would be satisfied with. But it sounds like from what you said earlier that maybe on a scale of one to ten, that it might be about a one. You think that might happen? Hope springs eternal, as they say. Maybe I'm being generous, or was, is that about right? I think that's about right. Thank you. You can see all the noise in the building. It'll come to pass one way or the other, but. Uh, it's going to be a heavy lift getting there. Thank you for your time this morning. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me.